So my name's Sarah Callaghan and um, I work for the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis, which is um, one of the UK's Natural Environment Research Council's designated environmental data centres. And as Pekka already said, I also am editor-in-chief of the Codata Data Science Journal. So I'm here kind of representing Codata for this event um, because I was also part of the um, Codata task group on data citation that came up with the out-of-sight uh, report that Pekka mentioned earlier. So before I start going on about data citation in my slides, just wanted to ask a, qu a few quick questions. So how many of you have actually uh, created data sets yourself? Okay, good. Uh, how many are you, of you are responsible for managing and um, looking after data sets? Okay. And how many of you actually publish data sets? Okay. Well, there's a few kind of, maybe, what does publish mean? Anyway, let's not worry about it. Uh, well, cool, great. Okay, um, final question. How many of you have heard me talk before? <laughs> okay, it's all right, there's plenty of cat pictures. I get complaints on Twitter if I don't have enough cat pictures in my presentations. That's all right. Okay. Data. Everybody keeps talking about data. Everybody keeps saying things like, oh my God, we have so much data and there's only going to be more of it. And then we have kind of co front covers of The Economist and things like that and cartoons and all sorts. So uh, yeah, there's lots of data around. We're not going to stop getting data because people like creating it and it's getting easier and easier all the time. So we have to learn how to deal with it. And this can be quite tricky, as I'm sure you can appreciate. Because when we get down to it, the fundamental tenet of science is that it should be reproducible. You should run the same experiment in the same way and get the same results out again. Now this kind of falls down if you're working with observational data like metrological data or um, climate science or whatever. Um, because if I take a measurement out in that car, or outside here today and measure, say, what the atmosphere is doing, it will be different today than it was last week because I believe you had snow here in Helsinki last week, um, or at least there was a big pile of slush in the car park as I came in. Uh, so with observational data, we can't reproduce measurements that were taken in the past because we just don't have a time machine. And this is a problem. If we lose those observations, they're gone forever. And with things like climate change happening, we really need to keep those measurements because we don't know how we'll need them in the future, but we know that we probably will need them in the future. The other thing is, if we have poor data analysis and poor, yeah, um, poor treatment of data, you can make data do whatever you want it to, let's face it. If you're a statistician or a mathematician, you can make data jump through hoops to prove anything you want. It's only by having um, access to data that you can verify the conclusions that come out of data sets um, and people can actually check. And that's the other key tenant of scientific um, progress, that other people can verify your results. But if you want to verify people's results, you need to have access to their raw data. It used to be easy, and easy is in inverted commas, because journals way back into the 1600s, they started off and they published data. But their data was stuff like that. It was an image, that's from 1665, or it was as a table. Um, scientific papers, William Parsons, 3rd Earl of Ross, and that is... Um, that's an early microscope image, and that is um, astronomical data. And they were published as hard copy in papers. Used to be that. We used to be able to do that as a regular basis. This is a picture of the hard copy of the human genome at the Wellcome Collection in London, right? One human genome is in all those books, and that is very, very small text. That is published, but it is completely useless for anyone to do anything with it because you just, you just can't. There's too much of it. So we can't um, publish data sets in hard copy anymore. They're just too big, and they're, what's the point? I mean, the problem is, once the data gets disconnected from the paper, we start having problems with the data getting lost. And Nature did a um, study, or there was a study published in Nature in March 2012, um, where showing that actually uh, after a sh reasonably short amount of time, 
um, the data sets got disconnected from the papers and you couldn't find the data sets anymore. Um, and that is really not good. I mean, I'm sure nobody would disagree with me on that one. But the thing is, it's not just data we're talking about here. There is so much more to science than a published paper and a data set. We're talking about things like experimental protocols, workflows, software code, metadata, things that went wrong. There was this trending thing not so long ago, um, overly honest research methods, overly honest methods, which was brilliant because they documented important things about a person's uh, research that wouldn't get into the paper. Things like, uh, we only recovered two-thirds of the water monitors because the hurricane blew away the rest. That's the sort of information that doesn't go into papers, but it really should be because it captures the whole story. So, data citation and publication gets talked about an awful lot in the context of open data. Um, we want to encourage people to make their data open so more people can use it um, and more people can verify their results and all the rest of it. And data citation and publication is usually put forward as the way of rewarding people for making their data open. Um, and people talk about reward structures and incentives for researchers to make their data open. And this um, is a good, it, it's a good thing and publishing data is a good thing. Um, I do have to say that there are some caveats about treating data as a special case of publications, whereas actually it's probably more accurate to say that publications are a special case of data, but that's probably getting a bit technical. I want to say, however, that just like you can cite a, a paper that is behind a paywall, you can also cite a data set that isn't open. But having a data set that isn't open as being citable gives people information about that data set that they wouldn't get if it was on a CD in a desk drawer somewhere. Because if it's citable, if it has a DOI, you know you, somebody can find out that it exists as a data set, you know who's responsible for it, you know where you can find it, and you can probably know a little bit about what, is, what the data set actually is. There's generally an abstract associated with it, even if you can't go and automatically download it yourself. And that's a good thing. Citation is kind of even if it's a closed data set, you can encourage people to make their metadata open for that data set. Um, and that encourages them, kind of brings them one step closer to making their whole data set open. Um, and of course, there's very good reasons why we wouldn't want all data sets everywhere, without exception, to be open. Um, because some of them have confidential, confidentiality issues associated with them. Uh, so person's health re records. Or there could be conservation issues, like locations of um, very rare species that are, under, are at risk of poachers. Or there could be security issues, um, data and methodologies for building biological weapons. You don't want them kind of open for anyone on the internet to download. But I do maintain that there should be a very good reason for public fu publicly funded data not to be open. Closed should be the exception rather than the rule. Anyway, so most people have an idea of what a publication is. It looks something like that. It's a book, or it's a paper, or it's even a paper on a web page somewhere. I can safely say data sets are a lot more complicated than that. So, and trying to, if you want to get, spark a good topic of conversation at a conference dinner somewhere and you have a load of data professionals, ask them how to define a data set, sit back and they will argue about it for hours. Because it's really difficult. I mean, here we've got that huge wadge of text, that huge paragraph from data site, trying to define what a data set is. And you can have a look Recorded information, regardless of the form or medium on which it may be recorded, including writings, films, sound recordings, pictorial reproductions, drawings, designs, other graphic representations, procedural manuals, forms, diagrams, workflow charts, equipment descriptions, data files, data processes, processing or computer programs, software, statistical records, and other research data. I defy you to find anything in this world that does not come under that description. Right? I'm pretty sure, because it, it's so broad. In my opinion, and this is just my opinion, I maintain that a, a scientific data set or a data set is something that is the result of a well-defined process. It's scientifically meaningful, and you can argue about that, what that actually means until the cows come home. Um, and it's well-defined. There's a clear border around what's in the uh, data set and what isn't. I work in the earth sciences. Um, my collaboration and federation of data centers, we deal with data that is in a wide variety of formats and a wide variety of types. We've got time series, we've got four dimensional synthesized data sets, climate models, we've got two dimensional scans for weather radar, we've got um, t two dimensional snapshots at given time, so cloud camera pictures. We have rocks, 
We have ice cores, we have physical samples, we have lots and lots of stuff. This is all data. These are vastly, you treat these in vastly different ways to a paper. A paper is quite easy, or at least that's my opinion. Papers are also easy because you can look at a paper and go, right, here's a paper, oh yeah, I can read that, I know, I can recognise that that's in English. There are words there that I recognise, I might need a dictionary to kind of get the definitions of a few when there might be some terminology there that I don't get. But I'm reasonably confident that uh, I'd be able to understand that fairly easily. And even if it's just a couple of paragraphs, at least you can read that and get, start getting the gist of it. Here is an example data set. This is one that I created earlier, back in my research days. Those are the files on disk. The file names are completely meaningless to anybody with, but me and my colleagues. You actually figure out how to open the file and figure out that .000 doesn't actually mean anything as a file extension. Open it in WordPad and you get a whole slew of numbers. And you look at them and go, what are these? Data sets, you can't understand them unless you have the metadata associated with them. This is bad. I put my hands up. This is bad. I have fixed this, okay? <laughs> um, and the other thing about data, uh, as people who have created their own data sets know, it's hard work. You spend an awful lot of time working on the blasted things, and you synthesize it, and you analyze it, and then you present it as a result with one graph, and people go, why did you spend all that time on that one graph? And you go, ah. Um, also, you put all that work in, and then you realize that actually I need to document my data set so that somebody who isn't me can understand it and use it. And that takes time and effort as well. So it's hardly surprising that you get researchers who are kind of of the opinion that I'm all for the free sharing of information provided it's them sharing their information with us. Right? Um, and uh, this is a quote, but it's not a quote from a real person. It's a quote from a, uh, a character in one of the Terry Pratchett books. Um, who is the Arch-Chancellor of the Unseen University and the Discworld. I do recommend Discworld books if, if you haven't read them already, they're great. Researchers also get all panicky about the prospect of being scooped. It happened to me. If you want to hear my rant on the subject, I'll tell you at lunchtime. Um, but I can safely put my hand up and say that yes, I got scooped, but it did not impact my um, career in the slightest. So, there we go. So, Data citation and publication, it's a way of encouraging people to make their data open, it's a way of giving them credit for making their data open and available, and it's a way of um, attributing data. Now, scientific researchers are already used to attributing um, other scientists' work and giving them credit for it, and they do it all the time. Every single time you cite a paper, you are saying, this work came before mine and I acknowledge that precedent. All we have to do is make that slight shift where they do, um, where citing data becomes as natural as citing papers. Um, and we're kind of effectively piggybacking on a system that already exists uh, because it works for given values it works. You can probably talk to librarians and um, publishers and um, altmetrics type people and they will go off on a massive rant about how citation doesn't work at all but let's not go into that at the moment. But we can encourage people to cite their data sets like they would a journal paper. And they don't have to do anything different. They go to the repository web page and they copy and paste the citation, bang it into the reference list, sort it. So Peck has already introduced the out of um, sight, out of mind report. So I'm just mentioning it there. There's the DOI for it there. Um, in that report, there was the first principles for data citation, and I'm not going to go through these in, in detail because they're, they're fairly self-evident and standard. Um, so there's uh, the first five of them there, status of data. Uh, what it comes down to is we want to elevate the status of data to being a first-class research object. And that's a phrase that you hear kicked around an awful lot. Um, and then we have other principles, so ten in all. Uh, the CoData task group then worked together with a number of other people um, to produce the joint declaration of data citation principles where our ten, the ten CoData principles kind of got uh, squished down into eight, although if you note that uh, seven and eight of the, um, the joint declaration are kind of two for the price of one, um, so it's kind of back to being ten again. Um, have people heard of the joint declaration on data citation principles at all? Yes, anyone? 
No, some, some. Have you have people signed up for it? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. so, um, so basically, on the Force Eleven um, website, you can go and you can effectively sign your name and subscribe to these principles and uh, say say that I will follow these principles in whatever way I can. Right. So, encouraging people to make their data, it's not just enough to make it open, it has to be persistent as well, um, because um, if, it, it's, if it's on the internet one moment and gone the next, or if it changes dramatically every time you go and look at it, it's not going to be much use to people either. Um, and we also want to, encourage, to um, encourage them to actually make their data usable for other people. Um, so, I kind of think of a kind of three-dimensional axis. So we've got openness on one axis, quality on another axis, and then persistence on the third axis. And you can have different places for putting your data, um, and where they are kind of determines the quality of them, the openness, and how persistent they're likely to be. So a CD in a desk drawer, it's probably going to be fairly persistent, but it's not open at all. Um, and, uh, and quality, who knows? You get the subscription journal, and they will take um, what you've given them and publish it, and they will do um, peer review processes to add value to the, uh, the, the, the product, the paper, or the data. But again, that's, that's all locked down. You need to have money to be able to access it. You've got your open access journal there, which does the same peer review quality control, um, and it provi promotes, prom provides persistence, um, and also um, because it's open access, it gives you uh, um, openness as well. And you've got, so you've got your web page, which is very open, or can be very open, but who knows about quality or persistence, that sort of thing. So publishing, um, you can publish something by making it public. And that can be as simple as putting it up on a web page. But publishing can also mean making something public after some process that adds value to the user. Uh, so a peer review process to quality check what you're publishing. Um, and also provides a commitment to persistence, and that's really quite important if we want people to use the data in the future. So you can publish data, <laughs> stick it up on a web page, put it in the cloud, uh, attach it to a journal paper, use it and store it as supplementary materials. Um, journals aren't so keen on doing that anymore because they're realizing how big the data sets are and how much of a faff it actually is. Um, you can put it in a disciplinary or institutional repository, which I think is a good thing to do, but then I'm paid to say things like that because that's my day job. Um, and then finally, or in this list finally, you can publish it in a data journal. And uh, data journals that's, are special cases of uh, journals where you have a data set connected directly to a paper that just describes the data set. It doesn't do any analysis or... Um, uh, yeah, it doesn't produce any result. It just says, here is a data set, this is how it was collected, this is why it was collected, here are some possible uses for it, and that's it. So the data set is published as is. Um, and then the paper gets reviewed um, for readability, and the data set gets reviewed for usability, and then both things kind of get joined together, get published. And you get have data journals like um, Nature Scientific Data, um, the Geoscience Data Journal, which is a Wiley journal, and quite a lot of other ones. There's more and more data journals coming out uh, um, as time goes by because the publishers are realizing that there's actually an appetite for these. This is how not to publish your data set. Again, this is my, the corner of my office and a pile of CDs. Don't do it like that. Um, in my own defense, all the data on these CDs are also stored very nicely, prettified up and um, documented properly in the, uh, in the British Atmospheric Data Center, so I, I don't feel quite so bad showing off this picture. Um, as I mentioned usability earlier, that's crucial. You can make your data open by shoving it on a web page, but if you don't document it properly, no one's going to be able to use it. Um, I recommend this blog post because it is an absolutely magnificent rant about somebody going off on, dear funders, yes, of course I will make my data open. However, I will put it up on a website. Yeah, so when required to make my data available by my program manager, my collaborators, and ultimately by law, I will grudgingly do so by placing the raw data on an FTP site named with UUIDs like blah, 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 blah. 
I will under no circumstances make any attempt to provide analysis, source code, documentation for formats or any metadata with the raw data. When requested, and only when requested, I will provide an Excel spreadsheet linking the names to datasets with published results. The spreadsheet will likely be wrong, but since no one will be able to analyse the data, that won't matter. <laughs> Open is not enough. You can go, well, if the data is important, somebody, I'll just shove it out there and somebody will come along and, and figure it out and do some data archaeology and it'll all be fine. Yeah, here we have some very fine examples of really, really old data. So, uh, faceless disk, 1700 BC. Problem is, nobody can understand them. They're interesting historical artefacts, but we have no idea what they mean. And the chances of figuring out what they mean are kind of slim to non-existent. Um, the only reason we managed to crack hieroglyphics was because somebody found the Rosetta Stone. Before that, hieroglyphics were completely no clue at all. Um, data has to be understandable to be usable. And if you want usability, usability ties into trust and metadata and ties into trust as well. Um, you can get a really quick and easy idea of whether something is of good, whether a journal article is of good quality by skim reading it. You can tell that way. Um, you, you download the paper, have a quick read through. If it's full of typos and the um, graphs look really dodgy, you go, okay, I don't trust this don't, don't trust this one. It's a lot harder to tell that if you download multi gigabytes of data set. So you kind of need to use proxies for the quality of the data. Um, so uh, I'm more likely to trust a data set that I download from the British Atmospheric Data Centre than I am from a random Google web page somewhere. Um, and also, is there enough metadata so that you can understand or use the data? So I did a, um, um, an experiment where I went and reviewed a load of data sets to find out whether I could use them or not. There is a published data set out there where that paragraph there Rain.csv contains rainfall in millimetre for each month at Marysville, Victoria from January 1995 to February 2009. That is the entirety of the metadata associated with that data set. And I look at it and go, okay, we've got dates, that's helpful. What, when does it start? Where's Marysville, Victoria? Um, USA? Australia? I don't know. Millimeter, rainfall in millimetres? Okay, how was that calibrated? How was it collected? Was it a guy with a stick in a bucket? Or um, what's going on? It's, it's, it's just teasingly enough to think, okay, I might be able to use it, but not be very comfortable in trusting it if it was some, some data that I really needed to crucially prove a, a bit of analysis. Um, and again, I'm biased, but I maintain that in the same way that all, not, not all journal publishers are created equal, not all data repositories are crea created equal either. Um, but uh, people still, the big journal companies have lots of money and people whose job it is to go around promoting them. Data repositories, not so much. We kind of have to rely on word of mouth. Uh, right. So going into um, a bit more of a technical side of things. Um, as I said, I work for um, a data centre funded by the Natural Environment Research Council and we have been citing data sets using DOIs for several years now. I can't remember exactly how many. I think it's more than five now, which is great. We've been doing this by using DOIs um, and we chose DOIs because actionable, interoperable, persistent links for digital objects. Well, actually it's a digital link, not for a digital, so it's a digital link, it's a digital identifier rather than for an identifier for a digital object. So I could assign a DOI to my dog if I had one, but I don't. There we go. Um, people are used to using DOIs for citing journal articles and uh, journals are starting to require things to be cited using DOIs as the rule rather than the exception. And also we um, have a really good working relationship with the British Library and also with, with DataCite. So, because data tends to be so malleable and change so often, when we're citing our data sets, we, have to, we had to put some rules into place as to what we could cite and what we couldn't. And we decided that we would only cite data sets that were finished, that, were, that weren't being worked on anymore. So they had to be stable and frozen. Um, so our data sets that are cited have to be stable, 
not going to be modified. They've got to be complete. They're not going to be updated. They've got to be permanent. We've decided that when we assign a DOI to something, we are saying that we're going to make this data set available for the long term, um, as long as we possibly can. Um, and even if the data set does have to go away for some reason, then we will, uh, we will have to keep that landing page up to say this data set is no longer here because blah, and give the reasons. And we also maintain that when we assign a DUI to something, we are saying it, is, it meets our data center seal of approval. We've been through this, we've checked it out, um, it's of good quality. Um, and of course, all our DUIs resolve to a human readable landing page that gives a lot of information about the data set and links to associated metadata and documentation. Here's an example of published data set. Um, and this is our landing page for the DOI, and it's also our metadata catalog. And you can see right there, underneath the abstract, citable as. Someone can come along and go, copy, paste, references, done. Easy. And when you hit on the Get Data button, once you've logged in, you can download the data set, and it's all uh, formatted and packaged up into files on a daily basis in different um, folders. OK, so talking about data publication now, we've got a traditional method at the moment. seems to be that we have the author writing a paper, and then the journal publishes the paper, and the data is somewhere. It might be referenced in a footnote. It might be mentioned in the text, um, or it might not be mentioned at all. What we're really wanting to do is move to the situation when there's fixed links, fixed permanent links between the data set and the, da and the paper that, it ref that references the data set. Uh, here is an example of a data paper, that, um, one that I mentioned earlier. So this is the Geoscience Data Journal. It's a Royal Meteorological Society and Wiley Journal. And uh, it basically presents a data set as is. So this is a... Um, a paper, and then just underneath the abstract, you have the data sets with their DOIs, and there's um, more underneath the fold that I didn't manage to get on the, on the paper or on the page. And these data sets references are also in the reference list where they will get picked up by um, uh, re um, citation count systems and stuff like that. And there they are in the reference list. So, Finishing up with two minutes to spare, we need to improve, open the products of research to encourage people to um, uh, collaborate and innovate on these things. Um, it, it's an expensive business doing science. The more value we can get out of data, the better. The better. And also we want people to be open and transparent and trustworthy with their data. Um, we've all got to acknowledge that openness does come at a cost, though. It's not cheap. Um, it does take time and effort to make your data open and usable um, and understandable, but it's worth it if other people are going to be able to use it. And we kind of are promoting data citation and publication as the big carrot to wave in front of researchers to say, make your data open and good things will happen. Um, we're working on it. It's, the, the culture hasn't changed quite enough yet, so we can actually definitively say, yes, this will improve your situation if you do this. Um, we just don't know yet, but we think that's the right way to go, and we think it will happen. Everybody, we need to change the entirety of scientific culture to get people to cite data, and that's a tough job. But the good news is we've been banging on about this topic for many, many years now, and it already, it's, it's, the message seems to be going in. Um, so the culture change is actually happening, and it's a slow process, but we've just got to accept that. Nothing, nothing ever changes quickly. So I'm going to finish up with one final plea, um, which is when you're doing data citations or doing any sort of citations, please be careful of them. All right, I'll just read this out. Whenever you feel silly or stupid, whenever you feel like a lot of people are smarter than you, just remember on January 1st, 2016 at 2 p.m., according to, according to Google Scholar, there were 77 academic citations for a journal called Experimental Brian Research. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thanks, Sarah, for a very inspiring, fascinating talk. So I think we may have time for one question. Um, so yeah. please take the mic because we are being free. So I wait for the mic. Thank you for. 
very uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm a civil servant, mm -hmm. not a data specialist. But uh, yesterday, uh, Jean-Claude uh, Burgelmann from the EU Commission uh, stressed that uh, cross-disciplinary research was uh, very important mm -hmm. uh, according to this open science uh, agenda. And I was wondering, is it, um, what about making uh, data reusable across disciplines? Is, are you considering that as well? Yes. Uh, so. I'm, I work for a disciplinary repository. We specialise in atmospheric science, earth observation, climate change data, that sort of thing. But um, with the data citation, and because I work with other environmental science data centres who deal with um, polar science, oceanography and all the like, um, we do have to consider what is that core common metadata that we can share that other people can use. And it's um, having that core so um, things like, for a data set, the title of the data set, authors, creators, data publication, that sort of thing. And the abstract is really quite helpful. Um, in terms of what my own data centre does, we run reviews of our metadata records on a regular basis, like every year or so, where we get, um, we get uh, summer school or summer students in university undergrads and we get them to go through our data sets and go unexplained acronym, explain, and we get them to uh, kind of comment on the abstracts to make sure that they're understandable by people at their level of, uh, of um, education. So the more metadata you put in, you can get the really technical data that's really specialised, which is really helpful to the, the, the domain specialist, but you also want to have the non-domain specialist, the more general metadata, um, which helps non-specialist users to use it and actually data papers are really good ways of collecting all that metadata about the data set because it presents the data papers present that metadata in a human readable story sort of way it's a why did we collect this data set how did we collect it what were the problems associated with it what we can use in the future and that can give people a really good easy introduction to the data set without having to dive into the, the numbers and figure out what the metadata schema actually means. Okay, so yeah. I think we need to move on. So let's thank Sarah.